Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuhu to everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Ghazala Ahmad. Uh, I'm done, Kareem, before I start off. And, uh, okay. I'm audible to everyone? I'm audible? Yes, yes, loud and clear. Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, so I'd like to start off now. Uh, so about a couple of months ago, a female patient uh, aged about maybe 38 years, she was referred to my clinic. Uh, yes, sir. Sorry, if I can that? just interject, I think you need to uh, keep your video on because if you don't keep your video on, I think the share screening uh, doesn't work. Is it? Yeah, please keep your video on if you don't mind. Okay. okay. Shall I begin now? Please. So about a couple of months ago, a female patient uh, aged about 38 years was referred to me uh, to my clinic and her chief complaint was spacing loosening of her teeth and forward move, uh, movement of her teeth. Now she was very worried and uh, her only uh, concern was that she does not want to lose her teeth. Now at this stage she was uh, willing to Oops, I'm having a little difficulty. Just a minute please. Okay, she was willing to cooperate for uh, any treatment protocol. Okay, Dr. Ghazala, just a moment. I think your share screen is not working. Uh, is it now? Just a moment. Yeah, Nadi, just a moment. Uh, start again, if you don't mind. I'm going to apologize. Uh, Now, it is. Um, let just a moment. I'll ask him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're good to go. We're good to go. Yeah, we're good to go. Sorry, let, it's 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 recording anyway. Please, if you don't mind, I do apologize. Okay. So, uh, this patient who was referred to me was referred to me at an advanced stage of periodontal disease. Now, she was having uh, deep pockets, mobility uh, ranging from grade one to grade two with respect to various teeth in the anterior region. She had uh, extensive bone loss, which was greater than 50%. Now, in such a scenario, as a periodontist and uh, considering it a conservative approach, the only treatment plan I formulated for her was. Uh, to you know, um, halt the periodontal disease and then take care of the occlusal interferences, faulty restorations, and stabilize her periodontia. Now, my main concern with this whole issue is what if this patient was diagnosed at the earlier stages? Because she had visited the dentist a couple of times before she had uh, two or three FPDs and I think around five root canals done and she had a lot of dental treatment. So, uh, I uh, it would be so much more easier for both the dentist as well as the patient if the condition was diagnosed at an earlier stage. Now, why am I telling you? It's because the goal and objective of my uh, presentation today is to simplify and concise the whole concept of pathologic tooth migration and to emphasize on the fact that we as dentists have a very huge responsibility to you know, um, diagnose any dental issue at its initial stage. And also how important it is to include periodontal examination during your regular examination. Probably the patient has come to you for a, a filling or, uh, or a root canal, but always to include a periodontal examination would be uh, very beneficial and uh, I must say that pathologic tooth migration is one of uh, the main uh, etiological fact, uh, one of the main um, signs, sorry, signs for periodontal disease. So if any drifting or any migration, definitely pathologic tooth migration would be an indication that this patient is having some kind of periodontal disease. And all of us can uh, make this effort to diagnose these conditions at the initial stage. So this is my outline. Uh, I will be uh, dividing this whole session into two, uh, two parts. The first part, let us just talk about the theoretical aspects and we'll take a break. If you have any doubts, we'll clear them out and then go on to the second part where we will discuss a few case scenarios and what are the various Uh, 
results when balance among the factors that maintain the physiologic tooth position is disturbed by periodontal disease. Now, uh, mostly you see pathologic tooth migration in the anterior teeth region, but posterior teeth may be affected. We can't rule out that. Now, what exactly is the pathogenesis? How exactly does the pathologic tooth migration occur? Uh, there are two main factors that play uh, an important role in maintaining the health of the periodontium and the uh, normal position of the teeth. One is the height and the health of periodontium. The other one are the forces that act on teeth. Let us consider height and health of the periodontium. Now, when we consider height and health of the periodontium, it's a very known fact that, and it's a proven fact in literature, that any amount of periodontal destruction plays a very significant role in holding the tooth in position. As the periodontal de uh, de disease advances, there will be more and more bone loss, more and more attachment loss, and teeth that are subjected to abnormal forces with a compromised periodontium definitely tend to move out of their normal position. And if we consider the forces that are acting on teeth, these forces can be categorized into forces that are acting from the soft tissues that are surrounding the teeth and also forces that are uh, of occlusion or of the hard tissues within the oral cavity. Let us just consider the soft tissues first. Now, among the forces of the soft tissue, we have forces from the cheeks, from the lip. Uh, we also have forces from the tongue. Now, these uh, forces from the lips, cheek, and tongue, they are quite variable in nature, dependent on individual to individual, but definitely the forces which are acting from the tongue are quite uh, significantly higher than that of the lips and the cheek. Uh, any disturbance or any abnormal forces on compromised uh, teeth can lead to drifting away of the teeth. Um, also, uh, we have, as early as 1933, Hirschfeld described uh, the, that pathological migration can be seen uh, in teeth which have deep pockets and a lot of granulation tissue. And this granulation tissue tends to apply pressure on the teeth, moving the teeth away from the deepest pocket, region of the pocket. And in many instances, it has been seen that just by simple degranulation and removal of uh, the debris and the granulation tissue has led to resolving of this uh, condition. And um, another uh, important factor like uh, uh, which can be included under forces acting on teeth would be abnormal uh, apparent frenal attachments. Sometimes we see that uh, we have multiple frenal, uh, frenal attachments and these frenal attachments are quite uh, deeply embedded into tissues, extending up to the tip of the gingival papillae. Tendi uh, this can have uh, abnormal effects on the gum tissue as well as the periodontal tissue, leading to recession, bone loss, further complicated by abnormal forces leading to pathologic migration of teeth. Also, habits uh, cannot be ruled out. Uh, many habits such as uh, lip biting, tongue thrusting, uh, or, you know, use or usage of any wind uh, instruments or thumb tucking, nail biting, especially in adults. Even these habits are definitely associated with migration. And one important factor that we need to consider is that it is not... So Dr. Ghazala, can I interrupt, interrupt you, please? Your voice is breaking. Are you speaking through a... Um, sorry, through a earphone? No, sir. I'm speaking directly. Okay, sorry, there's, there's, there was some issue now, uh, but uh, I can hear you better now. Please, you can continue. Okay. So, one important factor in um, habits is that you do not consider uh, just the magnitude of the force, but a more important factor is the duration of the force or the duration of the habit. The longer the duration of the habit, the more detrimental effects it has on the teeth. And the final uh, force forces by soft tissues are seen in tissues which are ginger inflamed and uh, uh, enlarged, uh, such as in gingival enlargement seen during uh, certain drug therapies like cyclosporin or phenytoin or any um, um, inflammatory, uh, any um, antihypertensive drugs. Uh, so most of the literature states that these gingival tissues once they are inflamed and fibrotic, tend to displace teeth out of their uh, uh, position 
and uh, cause a lot of uh, uh, aesthetic disfigurement and uh, it's really a uh, thing of concern for patients and we need to try to get this back to normal and consider all these forces all these uh, factors when we're trying to analyze or diagnose a case moving on to the forces of occlusion we finished with the soft tissue forces now going on to the hard tissue forces and what are the different types of uh, hard tissue forces that we see one uh, basically the force is uh, because of the tooth morphology and the cuspal inclination any time uh, there is loss of this tooth morphology or cuspal inclination uh, either because of parafunctional habits or some kind of restorative therapy we'll see that we see that there is abnormal distribution of occlusal forces leading to deleterious effects on the periodontia now apart from this we also see there is a loss of arch integrity Uh, whenever there is loss of one or two teeth in the arch the most frequently seen uh, uh, tooth missing in the uh, oral cavity is around the first molar and when you re uh, fail to replace these teeth what happens is uh, there is a migration of the teeth there's drifting of the teeth and unsettling of the occlusion also other factors like uh, the natural mesial tendency of migration uh, that the teeth have the location of contact points now location of contact point is also another very important factor it is very important that the proximal contacts are maintained to maintain a balanced occlusion these proximal contacts could be uh, destroyed either by uh, Uh, you know either by caries or by some faulty restorations or by even attrition in the proximal areas all these factors sorry ma'am can i interrupt yes i we've got uh, uh, extended time so you can you can take your time please slow down bit. yeah please be a bit more uh, slow if you don't mind okay. thank you okay so um, all these factors uh, come under uh, factors that maintain the normal occlusion um let us uh, just uh, analyze one of the most common scenario that is failure to replace the first molar because this is considered as one of the most common factors that lead, leads to a uh, collapse posterior bite leading to effects that deleterious effects on the anterior teeth or the uh, uh, front teeth uh, uh, leading to pathologic migration so what exactly happens is whenever a first permanent molar is missing and many a times patient do not take it very seriously and do not replace this tooth we have we see that there is drifting of the healthy surrounding teeth that is the premolars drift towards uh, the distal direction the second and the third molars drift towards the mesial direction and the opposing uh, arch teeth they slowly supra erupt into that space closing that space there is a collapse bite now all these happening in the posterior region can also be uh, can cause a dissettlement in the anterior uh, component of the arch too where your lingual uh, lower lingual uh, lower incisors or the lower mandibular incisors they tend to tip lingually and slowly there is a increase in the overbite so the lower anteriors will start hitting on the maxillary surfaces of the upper anteriors and uh, uh, the palatal surfaces of the upper anteriors and slowly the upper anteriors start flaring outward and protruding and there is increased spacing in the arch leading to pathologic migration so we see that um, any imbalance even uh, as uh, less uh, as uh, you know as minimal as a loss of a single tooth can lead to disruption of um, the occlusal forces leading to a whole array of uh, events that leads to a complete uh, pathologic event we also see that uh, uh, one major thing that we need to understand is that the most common factor is loss of periodontal support but when you add it on with abnormal forces this is going to aggravate and uh, cause more uh, deleterious effect and when it advances to a stage where we cannot do much about it the only option left would be extracting teeth and uh, due to sheer negligence by both the patient side as well as the uh, dentist side so if we summarize the etiological factors we have loss of periodontal support then uh, periodontal and periapical inflammation that is pressure from granulation tissue any gingival overgrowth because of uh, certain medications or because of inflammation and we've already discussed pressure from the oral musculatures then malpositioned uh, frenal attachments 
um, and all the various occlusal factors that we need to consider. At this uh, juncture, I would want to uh, convey the difference between what is pathologic migration and drifting. Many a times we confuse uh, pathologic migration and drifting to be one and the same. But here there is a slight difference. In both conditions, we have abnormal forces that are acting on tooth, but the difference is on which kind of teeth these forces are acting. In pathologic tooth migration, abnormal forces are acting on teeth that are very uh, compromised, periodontally compromised. They have inflammation, they have bone loss, and uh, they have attachment loss. And such teeth are uh, prone to uh, not be able to take up these loads and prone to pathologic migration. Now, drifting, on the other hand, is abnormal forces that are acting on healthy normal teeth now if we take an example if we take the previous example of the missing first molar as soon as the first molar is removed and then you do not replace this first molar the premolar and the molar tend to drift initially they are drifting and this drifting leads to unsettlement in the occlusion and later on we see the flaring of the maxillary uh, upper maxillary anterior so that is pathologic migration so um, i hope i've made myself clear until now so we've covered the pathogenesis and the various etiological factors in uh, pathologic tooth migration before i would uh, go in, go into the actual treatment aspects of pathologic migration I'd like to know if anybody has any doubts or queries or do you want me to repeat anything? Uh, Ma'am, I think, just give me a moment, please. I'm just going to look at the chat group and see if they wanted anything. Um, you can go to the next section. Okay and your strategies of management. I think that's where you're going to go in, aren't you? Yes, yes. Sorry, I, I, I messaged, uh, I need to ask, uh, uh, sorry, I'm gonna ask the others if they have any questions. Yes, ma'am, you can proceed. If I have any questions, we'll put it up on the question answer panel later on. Okay. Okay, going on to treatment modality. Uh, now, the mainstay of treatment for pathologic tooth migration and the first and foremost step would be definitive pocket therapy. By definitive pocket therapy, I mean a thorough round of supra as well as sub gingival sealing followed by um, a good debridement uh, and root planing and then re-evaluation after six weeks to see if uh, deep pockets have uh, resolved uh, and if the pockets have not resolved even after root planing and they are still about 5 mm in depth, then we would go in for uh, phase two of the periodontal therapy, that is the surgical phase, we would, where we, we would reflect and then debride that area. And uh, if any grafting or any other procedure is required and if we see any vertical defects, that can be done, followed by um, uh, certain other modalities like if the pocket is just localized to one uh, one particular region after phase one therapy you can just instead of going in for flap surgery you can go in for uh, local drug delivery and after phase one therapy if you feel that the entire um, periodontal condition has stabilized the pocket depth has reduced and um, uh, and also the uh, in many instances if the diastema also has reduced we can camouflage the remaining uh, aesthetic defect or aesthetic diastema that is remaining by either a restorative process uh, pro uh, camouflage or a prosthetic camouflage uh, that is restorative camouflage i mean uh, doing certain uh, composite veneers or uh, crowns prosthetic i mean crowns where you can close the diastema after the periodontal condition has been stabilized now, in cases where the uh, periodontal condition uh, is a little, um, you know, advanced stage, where you have around 50% um, of the bone loss, but yet you still have around 50% of bone remaining. And after the phase one therapy and after the phase two therapy, once the periodontium is stabilized, even orthodontic treatment can be uh, used to correct these uh, you know some teeth in pathologic tooth migration just from uh, apart from creating spaces they tend to flare they tend to extrude which cannot be uh, 
just treated without any orthodontic therapy. So if the periodontium is stable, then you can go ahead with orthodontic treatment, but orthodontic treatment also needs to be done with caution in such patients. We need to use very light uh, intrusive forces and uh, also maintain, make sure that the orthodontist and the periodontist are always in constant uh, communication. The patient needs to be re-evaluated on a monthly basis or at least once in three months. And at all stages of orthodontic treatment, the patient needs to be um, free of inflammation. And um, as an orthodontist, uh, he, orthodontist would usually prefer to do uh, bands in, uh, brackets instead of using bands and uh, light, um, light, very light forces. And also post orthodontically, uh, patients will be on a much a longer retention period than the regular patients. But in certain cases, when the disease is like very advanced, the bone loss is more than 50% and uh, you have uh, bone just left in the apical end. The teeth are very mobile. The teeth have extruded severely. They're causing extreme uh, uh, aesthetic disfigurement. In such cases, uh, the final option for treatment would be extraction and then replacement with a fixed prosthesis. You can al always, uh, you know, give a temporary prosthesis and then switch on to a final fixed uh, prosthesis once a final treatment plan has been formulated. Now, the Journal of uh, Indian Society of Periodontology, they summarize this entire treatment aspect in a very small, uh, concise table, which uh, I'd like to share here. Categorize patients into mild or early periodontitis patients, moderate periodontitis patients, and severe periodontitis patients with pathologic tooth migrations. So in the mild cases, they consider uh, it mild when the diastema is less than two millimeters, and it is due to some periodontal disease. There's no flaring or extrusion of the tooth. So in such cases, the treatment modality that uh, is suggested, suggested is uh, scaling and root planing, followed by flap if it is required. In most in instances, it has been see uh, seen that uh, the diastema usually closes because in most instances, this could be because of the pressure that the granulation tissue is um, applying on the tooth, which is within the pocket. Uh, formed around the tooth that is slowly mi migrating. Then in cases of uh, moderate periodontitis, here you will see a diastema and along with the diastema, you will also see extrusion and flaring of the teeth. Now here, apart from the per routine periodontal therapy, and once uh, you also require orthodontic forces. As I already mentioned, for, for us to start off orthodontic uh, treatment, the periodontal treatment should have been completed. The periodontium should be stabilized and at least 50% uh, or more than 50% of the uh, bone should be available. Uh, and these orthodontic forces that are applied should be very light and intrusive forces. And uh, at all phases of the orthodontic therapy, the periodontium should be free of inflammation. And the last uh, uh, scenario that they present with is when there is severe pathologic tooth migration because of periodontal disease, where the diastema is quite big, maybe around 3 mm, 4 mm. And apart from this, there's excessive flaring, extrusion, and added mobility of the tooth. In such case, uh, it's very difficult for us to control uh, the periodontal disease. Probably the pocket depth is so much that it has reached the apical end of the tooth. And um, in cases of teeth which have gone into grade three mobility from grade two to grade three, uh, these teeth have hopeless prognosis or usually uh, not so good prognosis. It's always better to extract these teeth and then give a provisional until you, uh, you know, you plan a final prosthetic therapy, either in form of a, a fixed partial denture or in the form of a implant uh, as uh, the situation is feasible. So uh, next, now we have a brief outline of how we usually treat pathologic tooth migration. Let us see the various case scenarios that are available in literature. Uh, if we actually search through literature, the level of evidence for uh, treatment modalities of pathologic tooth migration is usually conf confined to uh, case reports and case series. Uh, not very uh, 
uh, high level, strong evidence is available for these uh, for treatment modalities and um, so here in the following slides i would uh, just uh, briefly um, explain about each case report just to you know um, give a brief idea as to what are the various uh, types of treatment uh, modalities that have been tried out and uh, uh, how successful they have been not necessary that all doctors agree with the treatment modality but uh, these are the uh, clinical evidences that are available in literature so let us discuss a few of the cases uh, I'll discuss each case and uh, if there are any questions or any suggestions or any other way that you would want to treat this case, do uh, just write in your, uh, or you can always uh, uh, put in your question or query. Sorry, Dr. Ghazala, can I interrupt? There are some lines on the on your video screen. Is it your notepad or? I'm not sure, sir. Okay, please carry on. If, if... Um, I don't know how to remove them. <laughs> okay, no problem. You can carry on, please. Okay, uh, so the first case uh, that I would like to discuss is by the Dlani et al. Uh, from the Journal of Indian Society of Periodontology. Now, they reported a case. They had a 27-year-old female patient. She reported with a complaint of increasing spacing between her front teeth. And uh, this was happening around uh, since nine months. And she says prior to that, she did not have any space between her central incisors. So on oral examination, they found out that her uh, oral hygiene was quite poor uh, and uh, she had around a 9 mm pocket with respect to uh, the central incisor and uh, around 2 mm of a diastema present. There was increased in the uh, overbite, as a, a kind of traumatic bite present as you can see on the uh, photograph there. And intra-oral um, periapical radiograph, it showed a horizontal kind of a bone loss. But um, uh, quite uh, the, the good news here was that there was around more than 50% of bone that was present. So the treatment plan done by the Dlani et al. was to start off periodontal therapy. First, they did the initial therapy. And after the initial therapy, after six weeks, they re-evaluated the patient. Once the periodontium was stabilized, they planned for a surgery, they opened up the flap, they um, uh, did debridement and finally sutured it up. Also, this patient had a, a deep frenal attachment. So during this surgery, they tried to re relieve all those frenal attachments there and uh, put her on a retainer, a removal retainer, so that uh, the teeth do not uh, move back. And uh, about uh, six months after uh, the therapy, the tooth tend to uh, move back into space. The diastema that was created was almost closed. The only um, loss that they saw was of recession, maybe around one mm of recession on both the central incisors. And uh, apart from that, the tooth was great to mobile, but after the treatment, the mobility also had decreased. So this is this is one of the examples where uh, the uh, the tooth was managed conservatively rather than right away, straight away jumping into extracting and replacing with another tooth. Now, in this scenario, there was not too much of an extrusion or too much of a clearing. There was just slight uh, uh, di uh, diastema and slight mo uh, you know, outward movement of the tooth that was well, very well managed just with conservative periodontal therapy. Um, can we go on to the next case? Please, please do. So, uh, the, this is the last, uh, after six months, the IOPA that was taken. And uh, according to them, there was stable periodontium, no bleeding on probing. Uh, and this, uh, they've been following up this case for the next, uh, after two years, and they, they haven't seen any relapse of this uh, uh, pathologically, uh, of this diastema and uh, relapse of pathologic tooth migration. And they've been maintaining this case. So, this could be one of the treatment options just by uh, regular thorough periodontal therapy. Uh, the next case uh, would be again similar case but here in this case uh, I specifically chose this case just to differentiate between the first and the second one. In this case uh, again a 35 year old female patient she complained of increasing gap between her upper teeth and this was happening over a span of two years. Prior to this she did not have any space uh, she has no history of habits or smoking. Uh, she's a systemically healthy patient. So on clinical examination, they saw that there was a diastema of three millimeters uh, distance. 
and she had a pocket uh, ranging from 5 to 8 millimeters. The pocket depth was greater in the mesial aspect and in the palatal aspect. And uh, the tooth had migrated fa fa facially, distally, and occlusally. And the tooth was also great to mobile. Now, in such a scenario where you're having such a deep pocket, you're having uh, flaring, you're having uh, extrusion of the tooth, and uh, apart from that, you're having great to mobility. Our first instinct would be to extract the tooth and replace it. But uh, Agarwal et al. did not uh, do this. What they planned, so you can see the uh, intraoral periapical radiograph. We, we see that there is extensive bone loss, more than 50%, not like the previous case. But even in this case, they attempted to uh, uh, do a periodontal therapy. And they also saw that the patient did not have uh, a stable occlusion. She had uh, missing first molars and second molars on both the sides bilaterally. So for uh, as a temporary uh, modality, they came out of uh, uh, removal partial denture that would stabilize her occlusion during the periodontal treatment, post the periodontal treatment, helping in the healing. And uh, when they observed the patient uh, uh, after three weeks or of, of the periodontal therapy, they saw that the periodontium is stabilizing. All her inflammatory component has reduced. Her uh, pocket depth has reduced from nine millimeters to around uh, three millimeters or four millimeters. And also the diastema that was around three mm uh, has reduced to around one mm. So we see that most of the diastema that was created here was because of the impinging uh, um, pressure that was due to the granulation tissue or the tissues that are there in the deep pocket. And once the inflammation was resolved, the teeth went back into its original position and then the teeth were maintained either with a lingual splint and uh, followed up for the next two years and the uh, patient seems to be satisfied. But uh, again, this is individual choice. Uh, a case like this, uh, I would not say, uh, in, in a case report, the evidence is quite weak. It's not very strong. So you cannot say that this modality will work for every patient. It could have worked in this patient, although with such an extensive bone loss, extensive pocketing, but not necessary that it works in uh, you know all cases. But I, as a periodontist, would always uh, suggest trying to save a tooth rather than jumping into extracting a tooth. So I just posted this case uh, just to compare it with the previous one. Um, going on to the next case. Uh, Adana, assalamu alaikum. Sorry to interrupt before you go to case three. Yeah. We'll just take a question from Dr. Shiraz. Uh, okay. The case one, what you have shown, how did you correct the aesthetic part? Any, uh, can you shed some light on that, please? Just a minute, sir. Case since, yeah, because we are into case discussion now. Let us just uh, yes. take this question for now. Yeah. Um, in the case report mentioned there, they haven't uh, told what was done later, but they have told that they suggested an orthodontic uh, uh, therapy for the patient post the periodontal treatment. And the patient uh, has been kept on the follow up, but he hasn't uh, yet sta uh, started off any orthodontic uh, treatment. Because definitely you see that the space has reduced, but uh, aesthetically the tooth is still, uh, still slightly tilted and uh, uh, no, uh, not in an ideal position. So this is what they suggested that it could be corrected with uh, mild orthodontic uh, forces. And once the tooth comes into a quite good alignment and if the periodontium is stabilized, probably we can always go in for grafting, soft tissue grafts, connective tissue grafts, or free gingival grafts to cover up even the gingival defects that are there. Because in this case, in the case one, the bone support is around more than 50%. It's, it's not very compromised as you can see. What, what was done to correct the occlusal uh, uh, board, that bite which you said in this yeah, patient? That, uh, the patient was suggested that they, uh, after the periodontal therapy, once the periodontium was stabilized, orthodontic therapy was what was suggested for the patient. Uh, okay. The case report does not, uh, but yeah, if I would suggest, I would say that if you do not con correct that bite, there's no use of doing the entire periodontal therapy but because it becomes a vicious cycle again. So once you stabilize the periodontium, you need to take care of the occlusal factor because that occlusal factor is also an added factor that is causing the tooth to move away from that position. So yes, definitely this would be incomplete treatment if you're just going to treat the periodontal uh, condition. You need to have perio and ortho uh, to correct the uh, occlusal, uh, occlusion as well. Definitely. Right. Sorry. Uh, there's some... Um... 
questions with regards to case uh, two, which you were, we were actually going through. Okay. It, would you mind taking those questions? The first one was uh, from Nadim, uh, long-term prognosis of case two because of the extensive, extensive bone loss. Yes. And in relation to the same case, was endodontics required by Dr. Asim Basha? So if you could just clarify these two, please. Yeah. These two were my concerns too. That's why I mentioned that uh, uh, it has worked for um, uh, uh, Agarwal et al. And they have made a case report, but it's not necessary that it will work in all cases. In this case, if you see that the bone loss is up to the apical third, and in the distal aspect of the central incisor, that is 2-1, it's almost at the apical tip. So my treatment modality in this would be to first check the vitality. Uh, and then uh, probably I would not uh, venture into uh, trying to save uh, this kind of a tooth, which shows a little bit of poor prognosis where there's so much of uh, bone loss and so much of mobility. Uh, probably that's why I put up this case intentionally to show the difference that it's always uh, nice to put in a attempt and uh, efforts into a case which could have a good prognosis rather than trying to do heroic attempts in saving a tooth which has a, a poor prognosis because such teeth you do not you can't predict the outcome of a treatment it might work in some cases it might you know m not work in majority of the cases brilliant you can proceed now please okay so going on to case three the rest, case, the re sorry the rest the rest are general questions we'll take them in the end okay uh, going on to case three now here uh, this i've just put in to uh, show that uh, um, what could be done on a minimal, uh, minimalistic or a conservative type of an approach. Uh, here, the patient had uh, uh, pathologic tooth migration, but not no diastema as such. Slight rotation of the tooth, uh, gingival recession in that area, and uh, the only uh, and there was no mobility. This is what is reported in this case. And the way they managed it was by uh, carefully, uh, you know, selective grinding and getting both the teeth into uh, the same alignment and doing a, a little bit of composite camouflage. Composite. Laura, have you muted her? Hello. Oh no no she's she's quite oh, audible. Why is not audible, uh, Doctor Ghazala? Okay. Um, hello. Assalamualaikum. Okay. Just a moment, Ghazala. Just hold on. Yeah. Let me ask the others. She's audible. She's audible. Yeah, yeah, I she's audible. You need to check your uh, settings. She's audible. You continue with Dr. Ghazala. So, authors suggest the use of, uh, here in this case, the author suggested a use of a restorative camouflage. So, instead of going in for uh, extensive uh, crown preparations or tooth preparations and damaging the tooth more, a more conservative approach that they have suggested is the use of composites. Sometimes if you are not able to get the correct aesthetics because of the slight rotation or the flaring that is a flaring component of the pathologically migrated tooth, they also suggest that you could always consider ceramic or metal ceramic veneers or um, um, sorry, ceramic veneers or metal ceramic crowns as, uh, as per the feasibility of that situation. So this can't be done in all cases. Now, maybe in very mild cases, but I would again say, halt the disease, check for the occlusion, see what is the main uh, etiological factor that is causing. Once you've treated all this, and once you've got hold and control over the etiology of the whole uh, thing, and then you want just aesthetically correct this uh, uh, case, you can always go in for some kind of a restorative uh, camouflage like this also. Um, uh, the next uh, case is a very uh, interesting case. It's a case of a 51-year-old female patient. She complains of uh, bleeding gums and uh, chewing disability. Now, she is a renal transplant patient. Now, it's uh, known that renal transplant patients usually are on uh, immunosuppressive drugs uh, like uh, cyclosporins and uh, uh, cyclosporins, etc. So here, uh, this patient too was on cyclosporin and um, on, on examination and uh, clinical assessment, it was seen that she had severely inflamed uh, gingiva. As you can see, it's very evident. Also, she had fibrotic gingiva in the interdental, interpapillary inter region, in the facial aspect, in the lingual aspect. A spontaneous bleeding which was seen. Uh, there was also a diastema of about 2.5 millimeters in between the central incisors. Um, and if you see on one side, that's in the third quadrant and the second quadrant, she had missing posteriors. And on the other side, uh, with respect to a molar, she also has a fistula, which you can see. 
and intra um, and then intraoral periapical radiographs of this case showed extensive bone loss and uh, uh, and especially with respect to 46 there was uh, um, vertical bone loss extending up to the apex of the tooth maybe because of which there's a fistula that is formed now when you see a radiograph like this, when you see a full mouth case this, like this, which has extensive bone loss greater than 50% and so much of inflammation, very deep, full mouth, deep pockets, your first uh, thought process would be full mouth extractions and then rehabilitation. But uh, Chang et al. Uh, decided the other way around. So what they uh, planned was to do a thorough periodontal therapy, first phase one therapy, and followed by phase two therapy. And they also plan to extract teeth that had hopeless prognosis. And according to them, it was the lower four six that had hopeless prognosis. So they extracted the, those teeth. And once uh, after six to eight weeks of evaluation, when they found that the periodontal ligament had stabilized, periodontal condition had stabilized, there was decrease in bleeding, there was decrease in inflammation, the, the gingiva became firm. The diastema, the anterior 2.5 mm diastema closed. And once they saw all this was achieved, they uh, planned for uh, rehabilitation with a removable partial denture. And so that the occlusion is also balanced until they give a, you know, a permanent prosthesis. For the, for they, they tried to do this. And after this, they uh, followed, it up, followed it up for uh, two years. And they see that the periodontium is still uh, stabilized. Very rare to see such uh, such uh, good results, uh, especially in a case which had so much of bone loss, extensive bone loss all throughout the arch, full arch, upper arch and lower arch, greater than 50% of bone loss. And then uh, finally, these are the radiographs uh, after post two years after the um, treatment was done. And... Uh, this is one of the case I would I, I, I wanted to share because many a times when we see extensive bone loss and a full chronic uh, full blown chronic periodontitis case, the first at the first instinct we jump into is uh, uh, complete extraction and uh, um, rehabilitation. Yes, it would be a heroic attempt, and you know you, you cannot promise the patient that you know, I'm going to give you this kind of results in such a case, but um, there's no harm in trying if you would want to try and save the teeth. Especially considering the medical condition of the patient who's having a kidney transplant on so many immunosuppressant drugs. So you would want to try the most conservative approach as possible, trying to save, save the natural teeth uh, as uh, much as possible. So can we go to the next case, inshallah. Uh, the next case is also a very interesting case. Here, uh, it was a 50 year old, uh, Male patient complained of a front tooth sloping down and opening up the space between the teeth. Now, um, on clinical examination, we saw that there's a huge diastema. And also, there was a vertical bone defect that was seen uh, with respect to the uh, pathologically migrated tooth. So, what uh, the team decided was... First, to stabilize the periodontium by uh, phase one therapy and then the phase two therapy, uh, opening up the, of the flap and debriding that area. And after the phase one and phase two of periodontal therapy was over and the tissues were stabilized, they saw that the uh, uh, diastema did not close uh, by itself because it's quite a huge one. So they thought of going in for an orthodontic therapy. And here in this case, they continued this orthodontic therapy for around uh, 10 months and slowly tried to close this uh, space. And once the space was closed, they had a long-term uh, retainer which was placed and um, first a removal retainer for around a year and then followed by a lingual bonded retainer that was uh, given to the patient. Despite this, if the, the whatever remaining aesthetic uh, defect that was uh, remaining, uh, they tried to, you know, close it down with a composite restoration or a composite veneer. And this is the condition of the tooth uh, around uh, two years from the treatment. Not much of bone fill that you can see. There is still that uh, bony defect, but the periodontium has been stable. There has not, uh, it hasn't progressed into a much deeper defect. And uh, we see that post orthodontic treatment, there is a uh, you know, slight uh, diastema, which has been closed in the clinical photographs using uh, composite veneers, uh, composite uh, restorations, I suppose. Uh, 
So this is another case where a combination of perio and ortho treatment plus a restorative camouflage at the end to give a final uh, result which has been used. Now, going on to the next case, again, how um, uh, clear aligners were used. The next two cases are about clear aligners. Now, uh, in the literature, there's a lot of uh, um, case reports that are uh, there where, uh, uh, you know, authors have used uh, periodontal therapy followed by clear aligner therapy to close these diastemas to treat uh, um, pathologic tooth migration or, di uh, or the, you know, the uh, movement of the teeth. But uh, most often we see that uh, this uh, kind of treatment is very case specific. You cannot say that this kind of uh, treatment will work in all cases. It has worked in these cases, but uh, to be sure that it will work in many cases, we need much more bigger studies. We need cross-sectional studies. We need randomized clinical trials, which are not available as of now for treatment modalities of pathologic tooth migration. So we are just left with uh, many case reports. We can just have an, uh, a look at these cases. So initially, this was the situation, and there was a bone loss which had both horizontal and vertical component. You can see there measured. And uh, clear, clear aligners were given. This uh, photograph was six weeks post uh, the clear aligners. And uh, after that, they uh, say that there was a decrease in both the vertical as well as the horizontal component and decrease in the um, bone uh, defect there. And because of the aligners, the diastema also was closed. And also the slight extrusion which was there, that was also taken care of, followed by a retainer uh, therapy or re prolonged retention that was uh, advised for the patient. Uh, a similar case, but the same group is when they saw a diastema in this uh, case. Now, in this case, uh, the uh, another uh, added problem was that uh, this 34-year-old uh, male patient had uh, an endoperial lesion with respect to this tooth. You, if you can see that uh, the vertical bone loss is almost extending up to the apex. So they, they did a vitality test and they saw there was a loss of vitality too. So along with periodontal therapy, they also did endodontic therapy and then um, orthodontic aligners. And then of, of course, uh, prosthetic uh, crowns were given. Mm. And this is how uh, the case uh, progressed. They, they said that uh, there was a considerable amount of uh, bone defect fill. But um, these case reports, uh, they have uh, given results that the bone fill was measured only radiographically. And if you see that bone fill or the um, uh, you know defect fill can, uh, cannot be just gauged by a radiograph alone. That's not the most accurate method. But this is what uh, the study says that um, there was a fill in the bone, uh, bony defect and there was quite uh, good results with these. And this is the post-op six months after the orthodontic treatment, after the crown placements and after the endodontic and entire uh, treatment uh, modalities that they considered. So uh, uh, one last case that I would like to discuss was uh, about uh, um, an 18 year old female patient. Now she complained of loose and extruded right upper front tooth. Uh, when on oral examination, they saw that uh, the lateral incisor had extruded and it had moved labially. Now this was giving an unesthetic un uh, appearance as whenever she smiled. So the treatment plan here was, uh, if you see even here, there is extensive bone loss mm, or more than 50% on one aspect. It's not complete. It's not both on mesial and distal. It's only on the distal aspect where the space is uh, or the diastema is created where you see the bone loss. And uh, so uh, also the vitality of the tooth was checked and found to be non-vital. And there was a slight periapical radiolucency. So they wanted to take care of that periapical infection. So an endodontic therapy also was in, um, initiated. First phase one and then the endodontic therapy followed by phase two. And once the phase two or the flap surgery was uh, done, they saw they, there was a defect. And in, in the defect, in, instead of using a graft and a PRF, they, they thought of using only PRF. But you can um, use, uh, there are a range of uh, materials where you can use either uh, graph plus PRF or PRF or some, some people do not use anything and they just deprive the area and close it up. But in this case, there is a huge defect that definitely requires some amount of uh, grafting. And once this was done, the, uh, the wound was sutured 
and the patient was re-evaluated. But when the patient was re-evaluated, they saw that the diastema hadn't closed. But yes, all the periodontal components, uh, the inflammation had reduced, the pocketing had reduced, and also uh, um, the tooth had stabilized. So what they thought was, since it was endodontically treated, they, uh, I think the slide is not working. Okay, since it was endodontically treated, uh, they planned for a crown, and the crown supported the endodontically treated tooth as well as it closed the diastema or the space that was present uh, distal to the lateral incisor. And uh, they had followed up the case for the next two years. And, uh, and uh, according to the case report, they say that everything has been uh, stable and uh, functioning. I'm sorry. Right, Dr. Dr. Ghazala, can you minimize your PowerPoint and do the, make it you know, big again? Yes. Is it working? The screen, the lines you have, is it on your computer? I, I'm not sure, sir. I'll Can you see some it. lines on your... Yes, it is on my computer, but I don't know how I got them. Okay, fine. That's, that's fine. Okay, fine. You can carry on, please. Um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure how I got them. Okay, that's fine. You carry on, please. Dr. Gazala? Dr. Gazala, can you hear me? Dr. Gazala? I think her uh, video is freezed. She needs to... Her system is... Uh... Has it hung or something? Yeah, 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 I think. Uh, I'm unable to hear her as well. Yes, I think to call her somebody needs to call her yeah can somebody call her please from there yeah just hold on a second Shiraz, do you have a number no no i don't have oh dr gaussia is calling don't worry okay yeah she's back she's back, back. she's back yeah sorry sir i don't know sorry. that's fine you can continue ma'am you can continue yeah, so uh, I've almost reached the end of my uh, seminar. Let's just get you interesting. So these are just a few treatment modalities that have been uh, presented in the literature, but just in the form of case reports and case series. I did not find any substantial studies uh, uh, of high level of evidence, uh, especially with respect to treatment modalities. Yes, there are a couple of good, you know, studies or evidences for the etiological factors that are related to pathologic tooth migration or the prevalence. Of Sorry, your voice is not clear, Dr. Gazala. Dr. Gazala. Or it's connection or the connection of pathological aggregation disease. All of this is a well established. Hello, Dr. Gazala. I think there is a problem with her connection. Yes, uh, it says in I think there is a problem with her connection. Right, has it frozen again, the screen? Yes, yes, there is, there is again. Uh, our video is stuck. Okay, fine. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll wait for a few more minutes. Let's see if she can yeah. put it back. Dr. Gautier, can you please call her again?
Mubarak, you are on, online? Yeah, we are online, but I think uh, uh, we've... What, uh, what, what, what we shall do is, we'll just wait for a minute. If she's not coming back online, can we start the question answer round? Yeah, I think that will be better. That will be better. We'll just give her a couple more minutes. Is that okay? Yeah, that would be I better, think, actually. Uh, I think it's better she leaves the meeting and rejoins again. Right, could somebody just give her another shout, if possible? I think if Dr. Gausia could call, yeah, that would be great. I think she's calling. Uh, sir, will you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, you can continue. You can continue. Um, I'm so sorry about this. Uh, I don't know. There's some okay. internet. Yeah, it happens. It happens. internet connection is unstable. Uh, is, was that the last slide, Dr. Azala, Dr. Amal? Okay. Uh, so you're able to hear me? Yeah, we are. We are yeah, loud and clear. Was that was that your last slide, which you were showing? No. Dr. We Azala? Can we can hear you, Dr. Dr. I think she's frozen again. Mm. I think right. our internet, uh, internet is unstable. Yeah, uh, let's start with the uh, panel questions. Is that okay? Let me just introduce the panelists. I think she's back. Uh, she's back. She's back. You're back. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, Gazal, I, I hand it over to you. Uh, was that your last? Yeah. No, That's no, fine. Please. Just two minutes. Yeah. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Uh, I'm so sorry to the entire audience. Okay. So. These were just a couple of case reports that I presented. I do not personally endorse any of them or I do not support any treatment modalities. In every case, the judgment depends on the clinician as to how he wants to treat a particular case. And before treating any case, it's always important to assess the prognosis of a tooth for how long would the tooth stay in the mouth and is it worth attempting anything heroic when the prognosis is poor. Uh, all these questions need to be uh, considered and uh, taken care of before we attempt uh, treating of a pathological mi migrated tooth in an advanced uh, periodontal uh, uh, disease case. But in cases of uh, mild to moderate uh, cases, there's always uh, the treatment modality remains the same where you uh, do periodontal therapy and then follow it up by either ortho or prosthodontic therapy. So the main uh, points that I would want you to take home from this uh, webinar would be that the control of periodontal disease is of utmost importance and that uh, treatment of occlusal factors and habits should never be, um, you know, uh, taken very lightly. It is very important to maintain a harmonious occlusal, uh, uh, harmonious occlusion so that it does not have any deleterious, deleterious effects on the periodontal tissue. And finally, uh, as uh, dentists and general practitioners, it is um, uh, of utmost importance that we detect any disease at its early stage and uh, try to do prompt and apt treatment for that particular case rather than waiting for it to progress to such a state that the only option remaining with us is to extract and replace a natural tooth. Thank you for your uh, patient listening. I'm really sorry for the interruption in the middle. Oh, you're very welcome, ma'am, for your presentation. Thank you very much. And we thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, let's proceed with the panel discussions. Before we start, I'm going to say that um, Nadeem Ahmed is the moderator, so he would be going through the questions and uh, asking, putting it across to the panels. And am I, in, amongst the panel, we have two esteemed uh, periodontal specialists. One is Dr. Fauzi Atarannum, and we all know about her, the senior most periodontal specialist in our team. And the other one is Dr. Mazamil Mohin Ahmed, who's currently pursuing his PhD, if I'm not wrong. So with, uh, without delay, let's pass on and go with the panel discussions. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, it's all yours. Uh, can you ask uh, them to come uh, on their videos, please? Yeah, please yeah, that would ask the panel members to come on the videos. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm going to mute myself and I'll get Nadeem to talk.
Yes, are the, are the panelists uh, on board? Uh, Dr. Uh, Muzafil, can you share the video? Yeah, yeah, I can. Uh, Dr. Fauzia, Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Am I audible, Nadim? Uh, yeah, you're slightly feeble, Fauzia. Can you get your mic a little more front of you? You're slightly feeble. There's slight yeah. problem in my audio. I usually have complaints. Am I audible? You are, but uh, you know, you're quite feeble. We can manage, Alhamdulillah, we can manage. Uh, Dr. Muin? Yes, yes, I'm there. Can you yeah, hear me? Yeah, yeah, you're crisp and clear, buddy. Uh, we'll just take the question, inshallah, one by one. Uh, I will yes. just put all the questions according to the panel members. Can I have Dr. Asim Basha on the panelist list also, please? Because we had a lot of endo and, uh, uh, sorry, perio and ortho cases shown. Dr. Asim? Uh, Dr. Mazamil, can you uh, uh, turn on your video, please? Yeah, sure. Just a minute. Yeah, the first question is, uh, Dr. Fauzia, uh, what's the hormonal role in uh, PTM? Yeah, can you just elaborate that? It is not an exclusive question that hormones have a role in only pathologic tooth migration. Hormones as such have a very significant role in causing periodontal bone loss and gingival inflammation. Since both these factors are very significant in causing pathologic tooth migration, yes, definitely they play a very important role. Now, I think the first case that uh, Dr. Ghazala started with was a female patient. And I'm sure that patient would have definitely been at the peak of some kind of hormonal changes, though the hormonal changes are physiologic, when combined with other factors, yes, it is definitely a very significant thing that should be considered when we are handling the case clinically. Yeah, I think uh, uh, I just yes, add one I question was... along with the same question what you answered. What is the role of transeptal fibers in PTM? Transeptal fibers, again, it's not restricted only to PTM. Transeptal fibers are very important in any situation where tooth movement is occurring. They are part of both the gingival fibers and the periodontal fibers. And hence, any tooth movement to occur, the first fibers that should and must be affected are the transeptal fibers. And also during orthodontic tooth movements, these are the first fibers that tend to remodel themselves to accommodate the new position. So they play a very okay. important role in any kind of tooth movement, whether it is physiologic, whether it is pathologic, or it is orthodontic. Yeah, great, great. Uh, do we have uh, Dr. Asim on the panel? Because I'm not able yes. to see the video on my phone. Yeah, yeah, I'm there. I'm there, Dr. Uh, Nathim. Yeah, Dr. Asim, I think uh, uh, your own question, I'm going to pose it back to you. What is mm. the time interval between orthodontic treatment and periodontal surgery? If you are an orthodontist, uh, what is the time period would you like to give the periodontist to start with your treatment? See, usually what we have done is we have waited for six months also and also we have waited for one year. The idea is there should be no pathol uh, that is the active uh, treatment, active uh, disease in the tooth. Sorry, sorry to interrupt here. There is definitely a duration that we have to wait after the periodontal surgical procedures to kind of have any active forces on the tooth. The minimum time required is three months because there has to be a new junctional epithelium with new fibers and that has to mature. And the minimum <coughs> time required is three months. Okay, I would like to add on to this. wait for six months now. Uh, I no, would like to add on to this. Uh... The clinical signs and symptoms, the inflammation, the bleeding on probing, all that has to be under control. But histologically, the time taken for the new junctional epithelium that has formed after the surgical incision and the fibers to mature is minimum of three months. At three months, yes, some amount of forces can be applied. That again depends on what is the amount of available bone there. If it is an adult orthodontic patient, if it is a periodontally compromised situation, the forces remain less severe and milder. Mm. I would also add on to uh, it depends even on the type of periodontal surgery you have performed. If it is just a 
open flap debridement, I would suggest uh, I would wait for three months, as Fauzi Imam said, for complete healing. But if you are attempted for any kind of bone regenerative procedure, regenerative procedures, I would wait for six months at least. And even so as Dr. Azim said, sometimes we have to wait for much longer depending on the patient's response too. So I would conclude it is case specific then, right? Yes, it's a case specific, but as Fauzi Imam said, minimum three months, uh, at least till we expect a good soft tissue response. Okay. Uh, you mean to say, uh, clinically, we are going to judge and start the case. Uh, yes. You we need months, not take a new new radiographs to judge? We need not take any new radiographs? If I have done, a, if I have done a just a, a surgery without any kind of uh, bone uh, bone regenerative procedures or anything related to that, I would like just to wait for three months and I would evaluate if there's a good uh, soft tissue healing and uh, good response from the patient with his good maintenance, I would proceed with the orthodontic treatment. Okay. By chance, if you have placed any grafts or any kind of uh, a bone procedures, then I would, have, I would wait for more of like six months. Okay. Uh, so basically, I think the orthodontist and the periodontist coordinate together when to start the treatment exactly. Yes, yes. Yeah, fine, fine. Thanks a lot. I'll proceed to the next question. Uh, can we classify PTM based on the type of tooth movement as it has impact on treatment plan? Uh, yes, it was uh, my question only. Yeah, uh, I think, yeah, it's your question, Dr. Muzavan. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, uh, there is a literature that shows that uh, we do classify uh, PTM based on the type of tooth movement has occurred. It can be a rotation or it can be just a facial uh, flaring, facial flaring, or it can be a diastema, uh, proximal uh, drifting, okay, and even uh, extrusion. Okay, based on that, uh, these are the uh, different types we classify based on the position or the uh, type of movement. Okay, surely the treatment plan will depend uh, whether it is a rotated tooth or it is extruded tooth or uh, is there a facial flaring. This was the question what I meant to be answered. Uh, and, I, and I think you have two more questions of yours to be answered. Yes. I think your own questions. And I think you can... <laughs> Can well as answer that it's Let me uh, see my question. What was the one I had typed? Uh, it was like how much of bone loss must have occurred in patients to result in PTM and can PTM be hydrogenic? Uh, right. Uh, yes, uh, the literature shows, shows that okay, we can see when there is a bone loss uh, of around uh, 25%, the PTM has resulted in 33% of prevalence of um, PTM. Okay, as the bone loss increases, the prevalence of the uh, PTM has become more severe and more increased. So the 25% is the what uh, the literature suggests the start of the like uh, the minimum amount of the bone loss uh, that has occurred. Uh, what is, I don't know what's the opinion of Dr. Fauzi, ma'am, uh, about it. Dr. Fauzi? Yes, yes. Can you opine on this, please? Yes. See, the thing is, when we are talking about amount of bone loss, see, for tooth mobility to occur, there's something called a center of rotation that is there in a tooth. That depends on how much of bone loss has occurred. There are four surfaces where the bone is covered. Even if there is 90% bone loss on one surface with just 10% on one surface, the tooth may not move. There's something called a center of rotation. If the center of rotation of the tooth moves beyond 50% of the root length, the tooth movement occurs. This is the rule for tooth mobility to happen. But when we are talking about pathologic tooth migration, it can happen even with minimal bone loss. Now, there are so many orthodontists on the uh, meeting here. If you all can recall, even mild orthodontic forces, the tooth movement happens without any bone loss. There is controlled bone loss on one side, that is resorption, and controlled bone formation on the other aspect. So the tooth movement occurs. The same applies even to pathologic migration. Even with minimal bone loss, depending upon other factors, we should always remember pathologic migration is not just one particular situation. It is a clinical scenario which is caused because of multiple factors. There may be minimal bone loss, but the amount of 
force or the direction in which the force is acting on it may vary depending on that the migration begin even with radiograph may show 1 mm of bone loss but the pathologic migration would have definitely begun clinically examined sorry i, I need to interrupt here Sorry, I need to interrupt. We've skipped two questions here. One is uh, any reasons for physiological mesial migration? That's uh, one. Uh, I yeah, presume I it's probably was, uh, probably when the adjacent tooth is removed. I think that's what they meant. No, no, no. Sorry. Physiologic Sorry, you, uh, tooth migration happens in an intact, normally working dentition. That is why it is called physiologic. Physiologic okay. tooth migration happens in a healthy, complete dentition, even under normal occlusal forces. Because the occlusal plane is not perpendicular to our body axis or parallel to the floor. It is at an angle. And when the forces of occlusion happen on that angle, the teeth tends to migrate mesially because of proximal attrition. That is physiologic tooth migration. It, it is not pathologic. Any movement that happens beyond this is definitely pathologic. <laughs> missing, excess of occlusal forces, all these are pathologic. Normal occlusal forces through the lifetime of an individual, mesial migration of teeth occur because of proximal attrition. Brilliant. Ma'am, there's one more question. Um, uh, this is... Uh... It, I think this is something relevant clinically for all of us. Um, after how much time the pathologic migration starts following extraction of mandibular first molar? It begins immediately. Maybe immediately. not detectable clinically. See, always remember the periodontal ligament fibers are in a state of stability because of the forces acting on it in all directions. There are two teeth which are adjacent to it. There is an opposing tooth which is in occlusion. The periodontium is in health. So, periodontal ligament fibers are in a state of particular tension because of all this. The minute a tooth is removed, the adaptability of the periodontal ligament fibers changes. The shape of the periodontal ligaments begins to change and the tooth movement begins. Maybe it is microscopic. Maybe it is in micromillimeters. But the movement immediately begins after the extraction. Clinically significant or clinically observable difference may be after some time, but the tooth movement begins immediately. Thank you, ma'am. Right. Nadim, you can continue, please. Uh, excuse me. Uh, ma'am, uh, clinically detectable movement, uh, when can we see, ma'am? See, you must have observed. All of you as clinical practitioners would have done regular extraction. You extract the tooth. The patient comes <clears throat> back after six months. There may be just 0.5 millimeters of gap between the first and the second premolar after the first molar is extracted. Okay. Same case if you see after two years, it is more. See, it varies from patient to patient because again, it is multifactorial. What kind of occlusion the patient is having, how much of buccal musculature force the patient is existing with, how much of force is coming from the tongue. It depends on all this. The longer the duration, the bigger the amount of migration that has happened. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I'll go to the next question. I think, Dr. Moeen, you have asked the question from your side. Is it possible to elaborate more on habits like mouth breathing and lip biting? I will just add uh, one more question by Dr. Maslaudin. It is something similar of what question you have asked. What about tongue thrusting habit in PTM? If not addressed after the treatment, can it lead to the same diastema how it was pre-treatment? Can you answer both, Dr. Moeen? Uh, yes. Uh, in fact, actually, uh, Dr. Ghazala has answered it in a way. See, uh, as we know, like uh, any kind of hydrogenic, uh, this thing, like for example, um, improper margins of restorations, okay, or uh, heavy uh, uh, orthodontic forces, all this can uh, lead to, there are two things. One, the disturbance in the uh, periodontal health, okay, they can lead to uh, more of plaque accumulation and again leading to parental disease and that way again leading back to pathological tooth migration uh, tooth migration okay so same way it can in other mechanism it can disturb the normal uh, or it can put the heavy occlusal forces okay that again can uh, lead to the 
to my uh, my Dr. Dr. Moin, sorry to interrupt you. Sorry to Dr. Yes, Azala, please? can you please uh, uh, mute your uh, speaker, please, Dr. Purat? Dr. Kurath, please mute. Yeah, thank you. Uh, please continue, Dr. Moin. See, uh, let me summarize it in a very uh, short thing. Let it be uh, any habits or uh, any kind of, uh, even like I'm including both habits or even the, uh, your iatrogenic uh, uh, conditions. Okay, these can uh, indirectly lead to compromised parental health. Okay, as well as alter the normal occlusal forces. Okay which pedontium is not able to tolerate. So they can lead to the pathological tooth migration. Right. Hello. Right. Please continue, Dr. Moin. We are able to hear you. Tell me. Yeah. Uh, is it fine? Uh, that's the answer for my uh, question. Sorry, I would, I would, I would just give the to question to Dr. Asim here. Dr. Asim. I, yes, tell me. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Don't, don't, Asim, I would, I would pose the same question back to you. So in case if you, you happen to treat a, you know, a, a mouth breather or a lip uh, biting patient and uh, in case of a PTM uh, patient, what uh, your periodontist is going to treat the concerned patient and give it back to you. In case if you're not able to correct the habit uh, with some kind of retainers, what are the you know, uh, fixed retainers? Would you plan for a fixed retainer if not a removable one? Fixed retainers are usually planned after the treatment. Okay, they are mandatory okay. in most of the cases. Okay, okay. then regarding the, you have to break the habit. If you don't break the habit, if you don't correct the habit, then there's no point. It comes back actually. That muscle force is very big. So you have to correct the habit actually. You have to break the habit. Uh, and I would like as, to add on one as point. As we know, like, uh, see, for example, the mouth breathing, as we know that huh. uh, it is associated, like, it can lead to the parental disease by. Uh, drying the gingiva, increasing inflammation. So uh, th that itself, that is also like indirectly related to the PTM. That was my question, what I meant for this. Yes, sir, Dr. Gedala, right. please. You can, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, as I mentioned that the tongue is the strongest muscle in the body, one of the strongest muscles. Then. And if you're not uh, finding the exact etiology for the pathologic tooth migration, apart from periodontal disease, and not controlling that habit, is again a vicious cycle. You're not treating the cause. If you're not treating the cause, you're not going to get the results. So if you're just treating just the periodontal disease and not the habit, it's going to come back to the same. Or you just treat the habit and not the periodontal disease, it's it's the same. So you need to take it in a, uh, you need to see the whole picture and treat it as a whole. Uh, this was my question. I think Moin uh, has uh, put, put it forward. Smoking in PTM. I think we need to address the issue of smoking because I think that's a very, you know, major factor. So I, I'd, I'd, I'd ask uh, one of you to speak about that, if you don't mind, please. I think probably, Dr. Tosium, you can go ahead and speak about smoking cessation. Smoking and periodontal disease have a long way to go. They go hand in hand. Wherever there is smoking, there is definitely bone loss. Again, I repeat, when we are talking about pathologic tooth migration, it is not a disease entity we are talking about. It is a clinical scenario which appears because of combination of factors. And all of us know migration occurs because of bone loss. And we have any factor which plays a role in bone loss is an additive factor. It enhances, it exacerbates. In short to say, smoking cannot cause pathologic migration. Smoking causes bone loss. Bone loss causes migration. We have other factors and we have smoking. It is 1 plus 1 becoming 22. It is not 1 plus 1 is equal to 2. We have tongue twisting. We have periodontal inflammation. We have smoking habit. So whatever bone loss we see with a single cause, when all three combines, we will see bone loss, which is 10 times more. Smoking definitely is a contributing factor, not causing pathologic migration, causing bone loss. Yes, it worsens the situation. And unless the habit is eliminated, whatever treatment we are rendering will not give us the expected results. Thank you. Anim, you can continue, please. Yeah, the next question is by Dr. Shiraz. How to identify whether it's endoperio or perioendo? Um, uh, Dr. Muin or uh, Dr. <laughs> Fauzia, I think this is one of the most debatable topic till date. Endoperio or perioendo? No. Uh, Fauzia, your thoughts on this, uh, on this, please. Simple. If it was 
endoperio and a combined lesion it was confusing see when we say primary endo secondary perio that means we have an endodontic etiology that is either it's a trauma case patient has got history of trauma or the patient has got a cavity which is exposing the pulp when i say primary perio secondary endo there is absolutely no pulpal reason that can be identified clinically no history of trauma no cavity which is leading to the pulp or there is no vertical tooth fracture leading to the pulpal exposure it is very clearly clinically identifiable yet if we have a combined lesion where there is a pulpal cause frankly maybe a fracture maybe trauma maybe a cavity and there is severe periodontal bone loss yes this is like whether it was the egg first or a chick first anyway whatever is the etiology the treatment is the same it is always endo first wait for its response then render the periodontal treatment so you mean to say uh, default endo has to be done yes, yes. default if the pulp endo is the first involved, yes if the pulp is involved only then even severe periodontal bone loss with pulp vitality maintained does not require endodontic treatment if in oh, case right. we are facing the risk of damaging the periapical tissues during periodontal treatment we do endodontic treatment or if there is frank non vital pulp we do endodontic treatment first then followed by periodontal treatment <clears throat> can you can we get false positive test during endoperio lesions dr mubarak i think uh, you have done uh, uh, you do a lot of pulse sensibility tests in your practice can we get these uh, uh, false positive tests when uh, identifying the issue uh, not really unless the periodontal uh, the, the supply or the whatever the uh, vital supply is cut off you don't you usually if it's a periodontal primary perio then the tooth is vital the pulp is still alive and kicking so you generally don't get uh, false positives that easily with this that's great that's great ma uh, the next question uh, you want sorry? to ask something dr moy uh, sir no no dr siraj here uh, why yeah. do we do endo first ma sorry in combined cases why do we do endo first then perio why not uh, perio endo first and then endo see, see, just a uh, involve to the periapical tissues are unhealthy there is inflammation in the periapical area if that gets resolved it's easier for the periodontal inflammation to resolve itself if we resolve the periodontal inflammation that complete resolution doesn't occur in the periodontal tissues because the infection still continues from the pulpal end yeah it's like creating a closed chamber you are making the tooth uh, completely uh, sterile you have completely uh, blocked they taken out the root canal infection and the periapical infection so that when you do the periodontal therapy the periodontal therapy can respond to the maximum and give most favorable results uh, i have seen uh, in endoperio cases usually uh, when we do the other way round say if we do perio and then we do uh, usually it leads to uh, flare up maybe it is uh, related to some um, the bacterial load itself uh, is so much that uh, uh, you know just by reducing the bacterial load i think we are helping the immunity to take over and uh, periapical area is like a dead end it's like a culdi sac area yes yes so if we clear that first and then see anyway periodontal disease is being treated the healing the drainage everything happens through the pocket and it is an open area so whatever accumulates inside still has a leeway space to escape but the periapical area if it is not healed or resolved well it becomes enclosed over there and it it continues to seep into the periodontal ligament or into the periodontal pocket there is enough evidence to say that if there is endodontic involvement in a periodontally involved tooth endodontic treatment comes first wait for its resolution then do the periodontal treatment all right can i proceed to the next question dr shiraz go ahead yes, go ahead please. yes please go ahead sorry yeah uh, this question uh, from dr iftakhar uh, dr ghazala uh, in your case number 6 where uh, intrusion has been attempted uh what have you to say on the pulpal health of that particular tooth oh case number 6 i need to go yeah. to just a minute 
Uh, could you repeat the question, please? Uh, intrusion has been attempted in that particular case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what, what is your say on the pulpal health of the tooth? Um, I, I'm not sure how uh, I would want to answer that. Uh, Ma'am? Yes. Can I answer it? Can I uh, also? Yeah, yeah, Basha, yes, yes, please, please. Yeah, see, what happens is whenever uh, the periodontally uh, case comes, periodontally uh, compromised case comes, uh, and we start off with ortho, what, is the, what I have seen is there's a lot of alignment that takes place. And also there's increased root crown ratio. And also, there's a, the, in, initially we start off with a horizontal bone defect that is converted into a vertical bone defect. So in fact, uh, there'll be more amount of blood supply in that area. And more regeneration takes place. I don't think uh, the pulp will be compromised in any way. Most of the time, what we have seen. Thank you, sir. Uh, your, your, your I think uh, I think Dr. Iftikhar's concern was uh, applying uh, vertical forces, which will lead to uh, occlusion of the apical artery, which might lead to non-vertical. No, no. I think. Uh, what happens as you are going in? You are increasing the bone level. So yes. more amount of blood circulation takes place there. So that 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 area. And also, we are. Uh, yes, sir. We are not applying very heavy forces. It's been specified that it has to be light intrusive forces and controlled forces. You can't apply the normal uh, forces that you apply on a healthy tooth. This is a compromised periodontium and definitely the forces will be of much, much lighter intensity as comparison to the thing. So I do not think it should be that detrimental if you have ad adequate bone support. Well, I just want to um, extend this question. Like, okay, we are applying light forces on a tooth which is already periodontally compromised. I'm just going to uh, reiterate what Shiraz said. Uh, even although you're going to apply forces to it, you are still inadvertently damaging the epical uh, blood supply to that tooth. So, no, 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 it, it, that is not the scenario. See, what happens is, as, we, as the tooth intrudes inside, you know, there's a bone formation which takes place over there. The more amount of uh, blood supply is there in that area. Can I the uh, blood supply does we, okay. Okay. Let me put it this. Let me put it this way. What are the chances of inflammatory resorption, which is basically ankylosis in these kind of teeth? If it is very less, if it is controlled, very minimal re uh, resorption takes place. And especially in growing patients, we don't see much problem. Okay. I feel. I feel. I, I feel intrusion uh, mechanics. Question? Yes, yes, Dr. Fazia, please, please. Yeah. Yeah, Fazia, please go ahead. Please, please yeah. go, please go. We are talking about applying orthodontic forces on periodontally compromised tooth. Now, the question is specific to intrusion. Let me go back to a little bit of biology of orthodontic tooth movement. If all of us remember, you know, we have seen some pluses, some minuses during orthodontic tooth movement, right? So, yes. wherever there is pressure, there is bone resorption. <coughs> wherever there is tension or the periodontal ligament fibers get pulled, that is controlled forces. We are not talking about abnormal excessive forces. We are talking about controlled forces. The bone forms. The scenario is the same whether it is on the lateral aspects of the tooth or on the apical end. There is blood supply everywhere. It is not only the apical end where we are talking about vascularity. There is vascularity in the periodontal ligament all around the root. In the percussion area, which is a very significant uh, region in multi-rooted teeth, any force applied on the tooth in a controlled manner so as to help remodeling of the bone, then there is absolutely no compromise on the vascularity. Pressure areas, bone resorbs, tension areas, bone forms. Now, the clause is a periodontally compromised tooth. Let us remember when we're talking about periodontally compromised tooth, we're not talking about necrosed bone. We're talking about very much healthy bone. The bone is lost. What is remaining is definitely uh, actively healthy remodeling bone. Yes, again, it has to be free of inflammation. We have treated non-surgically. We have removed the cause of inflammation. There is no plaque. There is no bleeding on probing. Only then we begin orthodontic forces. That means we are dealing with 100% healthy bone. <coughs> can be dealt as we are dealing in any situation. Only thing is milder forces, slow movement because it is a mature bone. 
because it is bone which is recovered from inflammation. It will not cause any damage to the pulp. Uh, in a nutshell, what I understand is, I think ortho, uh, uh, orthodontic treatment can improve the periodontal health of yes, the... Yes, yes, yes. Most of the times it happens. In yes. areas, there, are, there have been evidences where there has been bone formation on one aspect. For example, if you have a lotal anterior, that is over incisor, there is recession, there is penetration on the buccal aspect. If you do slow bodily movement, again, it is bodily movement that is promoted. It is not tipping movement. Slow bodily movement with mild forces, you can see some amount of bone forming on the buccal aspect. There have been cases reported in the literature, though there is very few follow-up cases. Still, there is enough literature to support this aspect. Yeah, and like no, uh, Asim sir so, said, uh, yes sir, yes sir. No, if you give a little amount of palatal torque, no, in this case, uh, there will be buccal bone which is forming in the little plate. Because of the pressure, the thickness, you know, as you can see that the whole thickness comes back. You don't have to do any graft and all. Yes. And, and in many cases, we see that, uh, like Asim sir said, many vertical defects tend to resolve and form, hori make, become horizontal defects when with uh, proper controlled uh, uh, bodily movement of teeth with orthodontic forces. Horizontal to vertical, ma. Horizontal sorry. to vertical. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Horizontal. Horizontal. Yeah, yeah, vertical. Sorry, yeah. And, the, and you induce bleeding in that area. Once you induce bleeding in that area, regeneration takes place. Thank you. Nadim, continue, please. Right, right. Uh, I, I think I just want to, I have one more query, <coughs> Dr. Basha, right? I think one of the toughest mechanics yes, in orthodontics is intrusion mechanics. Yes, yes. Yeah, so... Yes, yes, uh, you're right, right. A case like... A case no, like no, actually, PTM, actually, it is, yeah. I see, actually, it is not uh, uh, thing, uh, difficult mechanics. Actually, mechanics are very simple, but the application of force and the judgment is on, in the clinician, clinician end. Yeah, that is what. Yeah, that is what I meant. <laughs> see, yes. I, I think any any given case in an experienced clinician hand is always easy. But uh, I meant the mechanics of intrusion, you know, is quite uh, voluminous, and it's uh, you need a lot of patience and lesser forces to intrude your teeth. So what I meant is, uh, cases like you know a severe PTM. Uh, do you reckon intrusion mechanics? Yeah, yeah, we have used, we have used a very mild force. Very after uh, after the removing the pathology of the area, mild force can be used, and it is right. quite successful. I have seen the teeth which are moving becoming strong like anything, right, become right. stable after some time. Mm. Right. Uh, the next question is, uh, I think uh, Dr. Asim, you have asked this question to Dr. Ghazala. I think Ghazala had a slide showing, you know, uh, treating with aligners. Uh, can aligners deepen the bite leading to more period problems? Uh, Dr. Ghazala? Uh, I'm not very well versed with uh, aligner treatments. I think Dr. Asim will be, uh, Asim sir will be able that's to... What doing, because the aligners, what you have shown, actually what happens is, uh, they deepen the bite. That causes more periodontal problems in future. So using aligners uh, in closure of diastema and all will be uh, actually technique sensitive, technique sensitive and case specific. Case specific. Okay. You, mean, uh, you mean to say you mean to say aligners are contraindicated in these cases, Vasha, right? It's better. You can keep your, uh, your you can keep your mechanics simple. Don't use aligners. I could like to comment. Uh, this is Dr. Abdul Moiz here. Uh, like yes. since uh, there is a topic which is uh, there is a talk which is happening about the aligners, uh, as sir oh, said, Dr. sir, I could no, like no, to no, differ. Yes, yes. Like, Dr. Moise is an orthodontist. Is an orthodontist. Please, Dr. Moise, your expert opinion on this. Tell me, uh, uh, sir, I, I'm just a student uh, in front of all these panelists. Sir, the thing is, like, I could like to differ with this point uh, about the uh, about the aligners which you are speaking about. There was an earlier misconception saying that, you know, like uh, by using an aligners, you might have a periodontal problem, you might develop a, a so-and-so problem. No, this is not so in the present uh, scenario. Like with the so many advancement which is happening, it, which is so, many, uh, so much of smart technologies which has been in, in place, especially uh, like whatever the, uh, now I can say that, you know, like uh, with the braces, there is, you know, like, uh, uh, like we, we, are, we are not able to make the three, uh, complete 3D movement. But yes, with the aligners, there is complete bodily movement which is happening. With the uh, braces, like we see, you know, first uh, tipping and then bodily moving, bodily movement. But with aligners, yes, it is uh, uh, like the bodily movement which is happening. 
and coming to the uh, question in concern like whether uh, the aligners can deepen the uh, 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 deepen the bite and resulting in a periodontal ligament uh, i mean periodontal uh, compromise i doubt in this because what happens is like uh, when when uh, aligners is specifically when you know when you are using it in a right proportion are very well uh, adaptable to the patients and periodontally it supports it so like i feel like uh, i uh, it, it, it in fact it helps uh, in the periodontal uh, growth rather than you know like uh, um, causing uh, uh, having an atherogenic effect uh, dr fauzia i would like to just uh, you know i would like you to answer this uh, i think uh, you have uh, seen cases with aligners when the aligners sit you know with they have you know active movement on the tooth uh, will that cause some amount of compression on the pdl yes definitely because aligners are almost like it's like interfering with the bite of the patient if the care is not taken to have only the required amount of forces and it is crossing its limit it will definitely have some amount of pressure on the periodontal ligament fibers and we will have long term bone loss leading to periodontal problems okay because uh, uh, align uh, dr Mo uh, dr mui is see aligners uh, unlike uh, when you do your uh, uh, your straight wire technique or your self uh, slb you have you know control forces at that particular moment but aligners do you have control forces with aligners yes sir with the present generation aligners but i don't uh, i don't recommend whatever the uh, domestically available aligners are but yes with invisalign which is happening in the current market yet it has got something called fast uh, uh, smart technologies like it does have a control forces you can you know like you can stop at particular time you can uh, you can progress uh, from the uh, from that moment of time so it has the uh, it has all that uh, what is expected out of the uh, technologies to do uh you need to go ahead with the yeah please tell me yes sir please uh, do we have to correlate our cases every 3 months or 6 months or 8 months uh, with an opg to see the perio status dr fauzia see 3 months there will not be any significant changes visible on a radiograph the minimum duration it takes for radiographic changes to be identifiable on a radiograph is at least 6 months yes changes like widening of the periodontal ligament will definitely be visible on a radiograph even in a duration which is as short as 6 months <clears throat> sir wanted to add some point dr asim sir please sir no actually uh, see when, when we when we take up these cases especially the perio cases periodontal periodontal compromise cases where see now we are talking about the pathological tooth migration here what we do is usually we start with something known as 2 by 2 appliances then we go by 2 by 4 appliances then we take up take all the other teeth in position we don't we don't take all the teeth in uh, same time do you remember that term? yes sir yes sir yeah that will be more helpful because we are giving aligners is more problematic that's what what we have seen in clinically in periodontal patients right thank you dr asim uh, the next question is to dr muin uh, is there any diagnostic devices to differentiate between uh, ptm and drifting dr muin uh as far as my knowledge is concerned uh, i'm not sure about it uh i would give this question to dr fauzi ma'am ma'am do you know anything about it no there are no diagnostic devices the biggest diagnostic device is our clinical skill again because here it is not just one situation it is a multifactorial and i think we already discussed physiologic tooth migration occurs when there are no abnormal factors there is tooth movement associated with any abnormal factor which is identified clinically leads to the diagnosis of pathologic tooth migration i don't think there's a requirement for any if it was the market is huge people are waiting to make one they would have definitely made one i don't think it's we mainly based on the <laughs> clinical diagnosis right yeah it's clinical diagnosis right uh, dr asim you have put forth a question can you just pose your your question to the panelists please uh, something to do with graphs yeah uh, how 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 good are graphs in this type of situation especially there's something called as uh, mdo gain Dr Asim is welcoming a seminar on periodontal regeneration. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
Yes, see, the definitely play very important. No, no, but they are regenerative materials with a huge market. Our endogen is back with a huge bang. The strawman company has relaunched it in a very large scale, and uh, I'm sure many practitioners are very much interested in it. It is not within the scope of today's discussion. Yes, they definitely have a role in periodontal bone regeneration. Again, there are specific indications where they give positive results. Not all cases where there is bone loss. I think Nadim is more familiar with my way of working. Not <laughs> all cases where you see bone, we can grow bone. Yeah, there are true, true, true. Indications where we can use this. They definitely have a very significant role in bone formation. And it, it's a huge discussion to do on the whole. Degenerative. Yeah, no, I'm true, also true, not true. Uh, very. Uh, I'm not also very. Uh, I'm, I'm favorite person of grafts. I even I don't like grafts. But I some people do like. I myself don't love graft very much, so I don't. Uh, Doctor Asim, I think people who really love to do grafts, I think they would like to place grafts even after simple extraction mechanics also. <laughs> yeah, if you give business to big companies, yes, we will definitely do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true, true. I think the next question is by Doctor Ramis. Is it possible to cover the black triangle caused by periodontitis in anterior teeth? Uh, yes. Is it? Uh, I think he's asking an ortho point of view, probably. No, it's again, it's a huge topic on its own. Yeah. Covering black tri black triangle is like a black hole for a periodontist. It's not a black <laughs> triangle; it's a black hole. Yeah. It's a very true, difficult true, true. situation. We cannot cover a black triangle. which is caused as a consequence of severe bone loss only in very mild cases where maybe 30% of the interdental papilla has recessed it is only the soft tissue filling that we give which again is reversible over a span of 5 years it goes back because it doesn't have underlying bone to support it for a long time there are wide variety of methods which have been attempted surgical methods curettage use of connective tissue grafts which have been attempted to cover black triangles again i repeat black triangle is like a black hole for a periodontist you know it, it ends in no it ends nowhere and it, there is nothing there but still it is an entity yeah the next question is by dr shiraz i think uh, this was addressed before but i think you can elaborate a bit on this the aesthetic concerns you know all ptm cases have aesthetic concerns so what are the options to correct it uh, in case of perio in, in relation to perio treatment modalities what are the options you can correct the aesthetic uh, part See again, it depends on what is the clinical presentation of that particular case. There can be a pathologic migration which is associated with a simple thing like recession. Now again, treating recession depends on what is the grade of recession, what is the prognosis of it, whether it is associated with underlying bone loss. The other aesthetic aspect of it is a rotated tooth, a buccally inclined tooth, an extruded tooth where orthodontics come into play. the aesthetics related to perio is only recession that we see if there is gingival enlargement it is very simple we do flap surgery or we do excisional surgeries to correct the contour of the soft tissues the critical concern is recession which again is a very crucial thing for a periodontist depending on what type if it's a narrow recession not associated with proximal bone loss will give wonderful results but the fact that pathologic migration has occurred that means there is underlying bone loss recession associated with underlying bone loss is a situation very difficult very challenging to treat see as per the literature uh, <clears throat> we can manage uh, just periodontally alone okay only for the mild and the uh, uh, mild uh, cases of ptm okay even uh, let it be whatever the aesthetic problem or whatever the problem related with the ptm okay Uh, according to a systematic review whenever it's not a mild okay if we have to go interdisciplinary in combination with orthodontic and restorative okay to correct let it be what are the consequence of the ptm aesthetic or the others right uh, i think one question i missed out in the center it was it is by dr masaluddin uh, masaluddin khan uh, he is asking you know put some light on high freenum uh, Uh, attachment cases which is causing diastema and flaring in the anterior teeth and after perio intervention how much period of fixed retention on the palatal aspect is required i think i would just rephrase uh, i think it, it's more to do with the ortho part uh, dr khan 
uh, your question is whether to give fixed retainer after how much period of time fixed retainer should be given. Is that your question, your query? Dr. Khan? Sorry, can I interrupt? I think Fayaz wanted to speak about aligners till this question is addressed, if that's okay. Fayaz, yeah, I... Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, that would be great. Fayaz, you can proceed. You wanted to say something Hi. about aligners? Hello. Hello. Yes, Dr. Fayaz. Okay. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum, everybody. Yeah. Uh, regarding aligners and uh, the fixed orthodontic treatment, I feel uh, when we consider the freehand orthodontics against the you know aligners for stabilizing, see aligners we know that they are pre-programmed, and uh, nowadays uh, we know that technology with the help of technology we can also quantify our forces. So when we are designing aligners, we know how much forces to put, whether you know to uh, do whatever kind of tooth movement you want to do, and uh, <coughs> Forces are really quantified there, and you can control the forces. So I feel uh, compared to freehand orthodontics, which we do uh, with the straight wire, straight wire or whatever, I think aligners uh, will have better control uh, to stabilize the teeth, and uh, especially in uh, cases which have migrations and things like that, where unstable occlusion is there, or teeth which are not stable uh, or mildly mobile. I think aligners will do a wonderful job. That's what I feel. Great, Dr. Fayaz. That's nice. Uh, uh, coming back to the previous question, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Fauzia, uh, regarding the frenal attachments, uh, and Dr. Basha, this, this this question is for both of you. When you would like to, you know, call the uh, periodontist when you have, you know, high frenal attachments, would you like to do it prior to your treatment or just during your finishing stages? When do you want to call the periodontist? Prior to. Just prior to finishing, usually. Uh, I, we start. We start of the. See, we start of the orthodontic. Yes, sir, Dr. Asi, please finish. Yeah, yeah. See, we start of the orthodontic treatment such that we can get the alignment, everything into position. Then we bring the teeth as close as possible. Then go ahead with the perio surgery, and then uh, close the uh, close the remaining diastema and give a permanent retention. Permanent retention means next uh, we can remove the retention after hundred years. Right. Uh, Fauzia, why we should not be doing uh, in I the start of the ortho treatment? Full of thought because the scar. If the diastema or the migration of the tooth have occurred because of very thick fibers and they are interfering with orthodontic closure, then we need to sever or cut those fibers, prevent that attachment from the teeth coming closer during orthodontic tooth movement. That's the first thing. We have to do circumferential incision and cutting of the fibers so that orthodontic tooth movement occurs because there have been cases where the fibers <clears throat> are so thick and so strong, they prevent the movement of the teeth even if orthodontic forces are applied. That's one scenario. The other scenario is if the tooth is amenable for movement and it is moving under orthodontic forces, wait for the final position of the tooth to be achieved to prevent a relapse we do the fiber cutting or the incision of the fiber. That is called CFF, supracrystal circumferential fibrotomy. Circumferential supracrystal fibrotomy, CSF. We do that so that the relapse doesn't occur. Now, whether the case requires permanent retention depends on, again, whether the fibers have come back in their old form, causing relapse. That is when we require permanent retention. If the fibers have not aligned themselves in the previous position and are not causing any tooth movement or relapse, we do not require permanent retention. Am I right, Dr. Asim? Yes, yes. Uh, I could like to comment on this, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, as ma'am said, uh, ma'am was very much right. It's not like we do it at the beginning of the treatment or it's not like we do after finishing the ortho treatment. It is like during the ortho, uh, during the tooth movement, we do, uh, 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 we do uh, uh, the flaps procedure, whatever it's planned, and then uh, uh, supracrystal fibrotomy. And then the, uh, about the retention part, yes, it is the fixed retention, which has to be for uh, as long as possible. It's like we say, it's for lifelong. Lifelong retention is required. Whatever the, uh, like, uh, however, uh, uh, what, uh, like supracrystal fibrotomy, like, you know, for how many days you leave them, like, you know, be it for 236 as what it is mentioned, 
uh, in the uh, in the literature it, it takes about 236 days for uh, to recontour or 232 days whatever it is like still you know like i have seen in my uh, uh, cases like even after you leave it like that after do, uh, doing that like there is chances of relapse so the uh, the retention part here is for permanent like and the two is a fixed uh, fixed retention and is permanent <clears throat> Uh, you were mentioning about you know creating a scar tissue uh, prior to the ortho treatment, right? It, it's like what what yes. we are doing is at the uh, during the ortho treatment which we have planned, sir. No, I'm asking uh, what if I do the treatment just before uh, starting initiating my ortho treatment? I put the put my treatment on hold. Can I complete my you know frenal attachment treatment, finish that, and start ortho? Is that uh, advisable or not advisable? But there are chances of, you know, like again, the fibers going back to its original place and all that. Like, I think the premier people are better to answer. But that... Uh... Uh, Dr. Mohin? Dr. Mohin? Okay, I think I lost Dr. Mohin. Dr. Fauzia, are you online? Yes, 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 Karim. Is, is, is there any harm doing perio intervention before ortho treatment regarding prenal attachments? Definitely not. That's what I said. See, if the demand of the situation and it is a requirement, you do it, you do it. Uh, it's not a contraindication. No, but uh, in regard to freedom, the most of the literature says that uh, scar tissue formation can lead to more of relapse. So it is better uh, not to attempt the phrenal uh, attachment or the phrenal phrenectomy procedure before the orthodontic treatment. This was the uh, this is what I found in the most of the literature, in my uh, what do you say, ma'am? The scar tissue might take a little time, Doctor Moin. Uh, in my uh, probably I might be wrong of uh, you know judging the case. Uh, I I finish my you know period treatment. I call a periodontist. I finish my prenatal attachment. By next week, I start my ortho treatment. Will that cause you know a severe scar formation within a week span? And no, but it, no, no. But uh, during the orthodontic treatment, it can lead to relapse, right? At least in the span. No, 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 no. The treatment. No, 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 no. A scar no, this is... will form if we are removing a significant amount of tissue, that is the fibers from there. Only then scar formation happens. If we yes, are uh, restricting uh, ourselves precisely to just severing of the fibers. See, there are fibers which meet like this. We are just cutting them off. They are no more in continuity. We have just cut them off and they are there. There's no yes, scope. I agree. Uh, this is in terms in case of... We uh, take out the bulk of some fibers from there. That is when we do free nectomy. Yes, that this is, is what I need to say. The risk of scar tissue formation and all the consequences, the problems that you people are discussing, yes, may arise. That is why during the orthodontic treatment, it is advised only to do fibrotomy. We are not talking about ectomy. We are talking about fibrotomy. Yes. Fibrotomy. The fibers are not uh, in yes. continuity. Yes. Right. I think Dr. Moeen was, was trying to tell that. I was referring to free nectomy rather than free notomy. Yeah. I was yeah. referring to fibrotomy. Right, Dr. Moeen. I think you were right. Can I just interrupt? Yeah. I think we have about 15 more minutes. I think uh, people are asking about time for Asar there. So yeah, yeah. I think we'll just take up two up. more questions and we'll call it a day. I think, yeah, I think we have two more, two or three more questions. Yes, please. Nadine, yeah. You can yeah, the next question is by Dr. Fayyaz, which is the most favorable occlusal scheme to prevent PTM? Occlusal scheme? What, what do you mean by occlusal scheme, Dr. Fayyaz? I think he left. He's coming back. Okay, go to the next question. There's, no go to the next question. There's only one occlusion that cannot cause problems and that is a well-balanced centric occlusion. Any occlusion apart from this will definitely lead to problems. I think he's gone out of the group. He'll come back. Well, we'll go to the next one uh, if possible, Nadim. Uh, I'm not able to understand the question asked by uh, uh, Dr. Nadim Ahmed. Uh, his question, Dr. Azala, uh, whether you would have taken up case four where is the red line to decide? Uh, I'm not able to, you know, elaborate, elaborate this I think question. Basically, basically, he's asking at what uh, moment of time you would say that case is hopeless and it can't be treated. So okay, okay. That was so a case four. So for any case, that's why I said you need to un uh, analyze the situation there, analyze the patient condition. A prognosis of a tooth is not just related to the tooth itself. 
you need to analyze the systemic condition of the patient you need to analyze the tooth related factors of the uh, uh, of the patient now the bone level the pocket that is there the remaining amount of attachment that is there the mobility of the tooth now all these factors together and if you if you see that most of these factors are towards hopeless prognosis i wouldn't go and attempt uh, a heroic attempt in saving and grafting and uh, uh, you know trying to save a tooth when there is a uh, bone loss till the apical third mobility which is grade 2 to grade 3 recession which is about 4 to 5 mm Uh, so this this is a clinical judgment which you need to see and analyze the tooth how how uh, uh, good periodontally sound it is if you have adequate bone greater than 50% just 1 or 2 mm or 3 mm of recession if you have grade, uh, grade 1 to grade 2 mobility and there's not too much of traumatic occlusion there you're able to settle, settle down the occlusion yes i would definitely try to save the tooth rather than jumping into extraction and implanting that area great i think i'm going to take the last question by dr nayar i'm going to break the question into two parts uh, the first part of the question uh, dr mohin uh, please answer controversy of the use of bisphosphonates in management of uh, periodontal disease sorry i would repeat controversy of use of bisphosphonates in management of periodontal disease see uh, it's uh, that itself is one more like a very vast topic of anti uh, resorptive agents in the periodontal right. disease management okay uh i see there there is uh, actually a quite of lot of uh, like uh, controversies like uh, it can lead to a lot of like osteo uh, ne necrosis and a lot of other things i really need to prepare on this topic i really not ready with this right now yeah probably we might have a short uh, webinar on this job i mean what do you say on that it's essential it's a really good like uh, topic to have a yeah that's webinar. great that's great uh nadim part yeah nadim nadim i i was found yeah see actually with this uh, what happens is there's a uh, 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 resorption doesn't occur in with this tablets with this medication so in fact this medication has been helped uh, with this uh, this phosphonates osteoclastic activity is uh, doesn't take place with this medicine so in fact in some studies what they have shown is it helps in retention in this type of cases no the issue with bisphosphonates is yes definitely as you said it prevents osteoclastic activity but using them for a small benefit as a periodontal benefit is not very advisable because there's something called as the risks outweigh the benefit it is advised in patients with osteoporosis because it is a systemic problem it can cause physical crippling to the patient the quality of life gets affected so even if there are risks the benefits in these situations outweigh the risks it is an entire host modulator we should remember it is not something like mm -hmm. uh, catapult you know we put a stone in it and we have to hit the fruit it goes and hits only that fruit it is not like that it is like a chemical rain on the whole body it acts on various systems it acts on the host modulation of the patient and it is not advisable to use this for periodontal benefit of late there have been attempts to kind of come up with options of local delivery but even in these there have been cases where it has shown necrosis of the bone right coming to the last part of the question and we'll call it a day after this uh, a note on management of spontaneous mobility after periodontal therapy in cases of drug induced gingival enlargements uh either dr fauzi or dr ghazala or moin can answer this tooth mobility doesn't occur only after treating drug induced enlargement any transient tooth mobility is an outcome of any periodontal therapy because of the inflammatory state whether we have done a surgical procedure all the tissues there including the gingiva the bone the periodontal ligament are under the influence of inflammation there are high levels of cytokines there is a hyperinflammatory state the periodontal ligament fibers are not able to sustain that inflammatory state they become lax there is transient mobility after any periodontal surgical in fact even after non surgical treatment in a severe case where we have done root planing 
the patient comes back and complains with tooth mobility and in fact it is identified even by us it is very much identifiable by us and it is transient the minute the inflammatory state subsides there is a resolution of the tissues the mobility ends but what is the prognosis in these kind of cases dr fauzia because drug induced might be very difficult to you know treat uh, even if you refer the patient back to the concerned physician The yeah if he doesn't want to alter the dose nadim doesn't depend yeah. on the severity of the soft tissue enlargement we may have very we have had enlargement i think if gazala can recall some of severe cases patient will not have competent slips not because of anything else but because of gingival enlargement we've seen such severe cases the prognosis is not the volume of the soft tissue that we see it is the amount of remaining of supporting bone and any tooth which is got up to 50% of bone how much ever deep the pocket is how much ever severe the volume of the soft tissue is it doesn't interfere with the prognosis or the outcome of the treatment and of course we should not have other systemic factors like uncontrolled diabetes patient who is on immune suppressants these are the difficult cases you know this is where the prognosis becomes weaker prognosis never becomes weaker because of one factor see in a systemically healthy individual even with a pocket depth of 10 mm with bone loss of 60% remaining only 40% still we have given very good results if we control the inflammation the criteria is he has to meet his clinician his uh, concerned clinician to alter his dosage or something see all cases we cannot do that again i will tell you see it is a systemic condition see what if we have a patient of status epilepticus we cannot change the drug because phenytoin is the only use, i mean the drug of choice there is no other alternative if we have any alternative it is not going to have the effect, same effect as the phenytoin so just for a simple situation like gingival enlargement a periodontist cannot ask the physician to simply replace the drug right right we right, cannot right. do that we have and again remember one thing drug uh, any gingival enlargement which is caused because of drugs doesn't happen per se only because of the drug we have to have local factors like plaque in the absence of plaque the fibroblasts are very much under control and they will not cause any enlargements um, and most of the cases we saw that the initial uh, periodontal therapy seems to resolve most of the fibrotic changes and most of the thing you do not have to go to that level where you need to change the drug but yes. some prophylaxis is done yes yeah, and you must have seen we follow up these patients don't come back with recurrent enlargements unless their oral hygiene goes poor and again they come back with enlargements so they don't come back with uh, that is the reason now the according to the latest uh, classification the drug drug induced gingival enlargements are under the pla plaque associated diseases yes that's great that's great fantabulous fantabulous answers yeah uh, dr mubarak uh, the stage is all yours yeah thanks a lot i have one last question sorry sorry to interrupt yeah i was about to say that shiraz your last question yeah go on you can proceed ask that yeah in uh, in clinical scenarios we usually come across this uh, scene where we place a crown and uh, with a very good uh, tight contacts okay and uh, after 3 months the patient comes back uh, with a open contact like you know he will complain of food loss uh, can anybody explain uh, what is the phenomenon uh, uh i think you are uh, and, uh, how to prevent open contact see if yes. the restoration that you have placed in the form of a crown is in a well balanced occlusion that means you don't have any high points it is uh, well contoured into proximally then you will not have any problem an ideal restoration will definitely not lead to any periodontal problems some situations yes tight contact it may become loose contact if you take a floss and try flossing that area it may have become loose because there is micro mobility in the tooth which has started because of high points again the high point is not necessarily only that when you check with an articulating paper and when you uh, very significant dark area that is not a high point invariably almost all restorations that we place are not placed in a balanced occlusion with the physiologic occlusion the patient had earlier that's first thing yes there is foot accumulation interdentally that is because all the labs the best of the labs have seen the crowns the interproximal contours do not comply with the health of the occlusion they are not contoured properly invariably there are open spaces in the interdental area foot accumulation inflammation first it is inflammation recession of the papilla 
food accumulation and patient will come back and say there is food accumulation six months from the crown placement patient will come back and say food is accumulating there because there is interdental bone loss another very important reason with due respect to all the restorative dentists there is violation of the biologic quit during the crown preparation mm. all of us want to place margin sub gingivally in that process you would have cut off some of the gingival fibers now the nature has its own way the bone resorbs the gingiva resists to maintain that distance that is what is clinically mm. seen as recession and followed by food accumulation that's that's the thing we are coming back to onlays and three quarter crowns which is going to be the best thing to use now but anyway we'll speak about that in a different day on a different topic but thank you very much for you, your... i would like to just uh, add on one thing uh, just yeah. one last sentence of mine uh, as for the literature uh, it says that the periodontal therapy alone in case of uh, diastema caused by pathological tooth migration okay only less than 1 millimeter can be treated by perio uh, periodontal treatment alone okay more than that needs orthodontic or other uh, treatment of options okay this is what i have uh, i would like to like i wanted to infect uh, like i don't know uh, whether fozia ma'am agree with this this was as per the systematic review uh, i don't know uh, exactly it's by gustavo at all Okay, it was the 2019 systematic review. As per uh, which it is mentioned in that, less than one millimeter of uh, diastema can be treated by uh, periodontal disease alone. Or uh, the two they say, partially or completely. Brilliant. Thank uh, you, Doctor Moin. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. Do you want to say something? No, no that's it. Well, thank you all. Uh, thank you, the esteemed panelists, uh, Dr. Taranum and Moin and Dr. Basha, and thank you, Gazala, for your wonderful presentation today. I am going to conclude the session. Um, any questions further? Please post it on the GDP, and we would be more than happy to try and answer to our abilities. Well, have a lovely day and uh, take care. Jazakallah khair. Thank you. Thank you. Jazakallah khair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.